Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, panel workshop for the day. Uh, my name is uh, Tupu Chatterjee. I'm assistant professor of global film and media at uh, University College Dublin, and I will be moderating this panel. Um, and our speakers today are Daniela Gatti, who is a clinical assistant professor in the writing program at NYU Shanghai. Um, Ahmad Alravi, who is a PhD student at Pennsylvania State University. Um, Simran Bhalla, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. And Enuri Jo, who is also at USC. Uh, she defended her dissertation in 2022, and she is patiently waiting for her doctoral degree in May 2023. Um, all right, so we will begin uh, the presentations. The speakers will have around 10 minutes to uh, present their papers, after which I will begin um, the Q&A with them. So for the first 20 minutes, um, it's going to be a closed Q&A with just me, after which I will open um, the panel to the audience for further discussion and questions. All right, so let's get started. Our first speaker is uh, Dania Lagati. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, so having um, read, hopefully, my paper, um, you already know what my central problem is. Uh, it's really all about dislodging the centrality that um, America slash the West occupies in our understanding of digital lives. And today, really what I just want to focus on is just a very, very, very simple, simplified example, um, which is Baidu, the a browser that and search engine that is sometimes known as Chinese Google. Um, and how Baidu basically organizes something that's as simple and seemingly universal and objective as information search in a completely different way than, uh, let's say, Google or Bing. Um, so let me go ahead and show you what the web browser looks like. Uh, seemingly, it just kind of looks like uh, Google. Uh, but let's uh, go ahead and do the search uh, that I did in my paper um, and see what the information search process itself looks like. So my search problem, just as a reminder, is essentially a purely logistical one. I'm trying to identify theaters in Shanghai. So um, typing the adequate words, Shanghai Zhuyuan, um, Shanghai theaters in Baidu search bar yields uh, the following results. Uh, we can see them here. Uh, they look similar to Google, but let's explore a little bit. So on the left-hand side, um, we've got the main results. Uh, these seem to be a list of theaters, so so far so good. Uh, on the right, there's another uh, collection in this box uh, of, again, what looks like theaters. But then let's start looking into these results in a little bit more detail. So for example, on the last, left, uh, you might notice that the Shanghai Grand Theater is overprivileged in these results. Uh, the second, third, and fifth results are uh, its website, an encyclopedia article about it, um, as well as um, its location in Baidu maps. Um, and then, um, okay. And then, uh, I mean, if you think about this, this is already, um, a little bit strange because we don't necessarily need three hits to just focus on this one theater. Uh, but then if we look further, the first hit is uh, not exactly a theater, but rather it's just one performance, uh, which is the um, Chinese version of Sleep No More. Um, so again, not quite adequate to our search. Um, further down, there is another theater that shows up, which is the upper theater. Um, so we do get some theaters, but ultimately um, these results are somewhat skewed and they seem to be skewing towards uh, results that look like they might be popular. A second important thing to notice is that uh, articles are kind of overprivileged as well. So we already talked about um, one encyclopedia article uh, that talks about the Shanghai Grand Theater, um, but we also have this uh, search box here on the right, uh, which is called Baidu Hot Search. These are all articles and they have no uh, relationship to the search at all. In fact, these are just popularly read, uh, mostly news articles. Um, so in other words, 
um, really, we don't get a whole lot of useful results. Part of the reason for that is that there simply aren't very many websites in the Chinese internet as such. Uh, websites are not a typical form um, for any cultural institution or any institution at all to have. And so there's a lack of websites to show. But um, there's another way that I think Baidu is interesting in, in, in the way that it extends or di you know, differentiates information search. Uh, and that's through the, our ability to sort our results in a way that already kind of resembles social media. So like Google, you can sort results into uh, maps and whatever images. But here we have some other categories as well, uh, including this one, Jadao, uh, Tieba, uh, and Wanku. And these are, uh, they roughly mean no uh, post bar and library. And what they have in common is that they're essentially user directed and community based. So Jadao allows users to post questions and receive answers from other users. Wanku is a platform collecting mostly open access documents uploaded by users. And Tieba is essentially Baidu's discussion forum, which is kind of similar to Reddit. So in other words, while Baidu's main search already presents results that skew towards both articles and more popular results, its sorting options explicitly direct the user to conversations with other users. So information search is already structured as a crowdsourced activity where the search engine presents itself not so much as the tool that will help you find authoritative information, but rather as the tool that will present uh, users with other users who might be helpful in locating such information. So this is really all that I, I wanted to, to show you. Uh, I, I just want to conclude now. Um, and uh, we can, I think we can conclude three important takeaways about China uh, and then some about doing global media studies. Uh, first about China, the first thing is that navigating the internet here does not really feel like it does in the West. It does not feel like surfing an endless web uh, on a browser because it feels rather more limited. Second, the very logic based on which this information search works is completely different. It's a, it's a completely different logic um, and, and our analytical tools from the West don't really seem to work on it. Um, and third, um, information search in Baidu is already social. So information on the internet is anchored to the physical world uh, and to other people, whether they are in a friendship network or not. So what are the takeaways that I, I you know, want to draw from this for global media studies? Um, so I want to make four suggestions in the two minutes that I have left. Um, first, I think we need to be aware that American apps and American and apps that resemble them are simply more visible to many of us working in global media studies because so many of us are either based in the U.S. or come from this system, uh, like myself. Um, and, and they are more visible to us even when they are not the most relevant ones for the populations that we're studying. Um, so I think that there's a visibility problem here. Um, while Baidu might suggest itself, for example, as the closest equivalent to the Google search engine, I think it would be a category mistake to attempt to analyze information search in China based solely on Baidu. Because so much of the information search there is limited, already pushing towards social media, and the bulk of it actually happens on social media. Um, so second, um, in cases where American apps really are widely used, I think we should interrogate colonial histories of why that is the case. Uh, I don't think that people are using Google so widely and in so many places because it's simply better than its competitors, but rather there is a history uh, of digital media expansion and imperialism, I would say. And, and I think that that should be a much more explicit focus of our inquiry than it has been um, in the digital context. Uh, third, I think we should provincialize America to quote, um, or to, to sort of change uh, Dipesh Chakrabarty's call to provincialize Europe. That is, I think we need to make America and the US a, a specific site of research rather than a digital universal. And then finally, I think that if we want to be more adequate to the multiplicity of global digital worlds, I think we need to move away uh, from a primary focus on discourse and behavior and turn instead to interfaces and platforms, if not code itself, because analyzing what people say and do inevitably downplays the differences of digital worlds. So in my example, and this is really my last word, 
um, it would risk uh, showing the Chinese internet as simply owing to the fact that Chinese people um, are just more social anyway, right? Uh, but that's, that's overlooking the fact that the interface is already structured in this more social vein. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much. I really look forward to your questions. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here to present my current research about the Iraq rural broadband policy and deployment. Um, so this research examined the intersection between the Iraq rural broadband policy issues and uh, rural Iraqis' uh, experience regarding accessing the broadband um, uh, connection. So just the background information about this um, topic, the lack of accessibility to broadband connection uh, in rural Iraqi areas has been a policy issue for the last decade. Unlike uh, uh, urban cities uh, that are provided with a reliable broadband connection, uh, rural areas still um, suffering from the lack of accessibility to uh, broadband connection. And when I say uh, a reliable broadband connection, I mean a fast and steady internet connection. So. Uh, there are two major crises basically intensified this uh, issue. First is the appearance of ISIS back in 2014 to, th to 2017, <coughs> then followed by uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. These two uh, crises basically forced many uh, rural Iraqis to rely more on the uh, internet for um, to work remotely, uh, for education and to access health information. So here we're talking about um, over 11 million rural residents who make up about 26% of the total Iraqi population of 42 million are heavily impacted by the lack of accessibility uh, to the broadband connection. So uh, I decided to conduct this exploratory research uh, for the following two main objectives. First is to examine the uh, uh, intersection between the policy, rural broadband policy, uh, issues with uh, rural Iraqis experience regarding accessing the uh, broadband connection. And second, which is uh, even more important, is uh, to bring a unique and rare information about the Iraqi telecommunication sector that I'm hoping uh, that I could uh, contribute to closing the knowledge gap in the uh, telecommunication sector, especially regarding issue issues reg uh, related to the rural broadband policy in Iraq. So uh, I started to investigate this uh, research from the bottom, relying on um, qualitative uh, uh, methods. I uh, came up with these two research questions. The first one is related to the uh, rural broadband uh, policy issues. I asked, what are the primary objectives of the Iraqi rural broadband policy? Uh, and for the second question, which is related to rural Iraqis' uh, experience regarding the uh, accessing the broadband connection, I ask how does the Iraqi rural broadband policy compare with the experiences of rural Iraqis regarding broadband access? So I used a, a thematic coding analysis, uh, and basically this uh, research is still in progress, um, but I used thematic coding analysis to do the following or to uh, address uh, these uh, two uh, research questions. For the first part, or for the uh, research question that that is uh, related to the rural broadband policy, uh, I choose the um, uh, National Internet uh, uh, Project um, uh, documents to analyze it. Uh, why I choose the or then IP project or then IP documents. Why I choose the internet. Uh, 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 the National Internet Project is uh, because uh, this is the only and the main uh, rural broadband policy implemented by the uh, Ministry of Communication of Iraq. And also the NIP documents basically summarize the uh, rural broadband uh, policy implemented by the Ministry of Communication of Iraq. For the second part, which is related to uh, research question two, uh, the experience of rural Iraqis regarding, uh, regarding ex uh, accessing the broadband connection. I interviewed 19 rural Iraqis uh, from five different counties uh, labeled by the Ministry of Communications um, as uh, uh, rural counties lacks of accessibility to uh, the broadband connection. So uh, here's my initial findings uh, for the rural broadband policy. Uh, I have the following three uh, main themes. First is freedom in allocating money. So the Ministry of Communication of Iraq gives more freedom to the telecommunication companies to um, 
would withdraw from the allocated money uh, that he uh, that is basically um, dedicated to build the broadband connection in rural areas. So what we en we ended up uh, seeing. Um, more uh, uh, broadband inf infrastructure built in uh, urban areas and a few built in rural areas just because of this freedom. Um, the second theme is basically uh, freedom in mapping. Uh, here again, the Minister of Communication gives a freedom to the telecommunication companies to map the rural areas that, uh, that will be served with um, uh, broadband connection. And also here we saw more built in um, more mapped in uh, urban cities than um, in uh, rural areas. Also, another issue here in a freedom in mapping that I found is um, there are um, some rural counties or areas are uh, basically uh, wrongly mapped as served, which in fact it did not serve the with the broadband connection, as I will show you uh, in the picture uh, shortly. Um, so these wrongly mapped rural areas uh, will not benefit from future um, um, subsidies by the Ministry of Communication to build the broadband connection uh, uh, in their areas. The third theme is basically unrestricted time frame. Here the Ministry of Communication of Iraq um, did not restrict the uh, telecommunication companies with a specific time frame to finish these rural broadband um, uh, projects. So here we see this, the red stars here uh, and the map, this is the map of Iraq. We see these red stars are uh, basically the rural areas that are still uh, not connected or provided with a uh, broadband access. And here the telecommunication company, companies basically claims because of the security threats, which is unreasonable um, uh, reason uh, that they couldn't provide uh, these rural areas with um, a broadband connection until today's dates. Um, here the stars at the bottom shows the wrongly mapped rural areas uh, by the telecommunication companies, which uh, will not benefit from uh, future subsidies uh, by the Ministry of Communication to build infrastructure uh, in these rural uh, counties. Uh, I have um, four main themes um, came up for the uh, rural Iraqis experience regarding accessing the broadband connection. Uh, first is um, most of rural Iraqis uh, uh, illustrated that they are they feel uh, they're uh, excluded from having the broadband uh, service as an essential service they're not like those um, uh, of the residents of the main uh, urban areas um, um, and the second theme is basically many of the rural Iraqis uh, expressed uh, that they are uh, socially isolated specifically they're um, they're mentioning that they uh, they cannot uh, talk to their uh, families or friends, those who are living in different cities in Iraq or uh, those who are living in uh, foreign countries just because of the lack of accessibility to the broadband connection. Uh, many, the th third theme is basically many of uh, those rural Iraqis, um, they are waiting without hope to improve the broadband connection because they've been here a lot about improving the broadband connection for the last uh, over more than one decade, but nothing has changed. Uh, the last theme is basically many of rural Iraqis um, complained about having a uh, an intermittent and a slow internet uh, services in their uh, rural areas. And here is a screenshot of one of those uh, participants showing uh, through his cell phone uh, that is connected to his home um, internet. Uh, says no internet access, please check the, the router or consult your network service provider. Uh, so I'm still working on this uh, project um, and uh, it's still work in progress. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to this round table. Um, my presentation is entitled Fabricated Empires, Popular Media, Global Histories. So in my presentation today, I ask, one, how does heritage media engage global histories? And how can a global media studies lens produce new frameworks for understanding this kind of media? Um, and I use heritage media as kind of like a broader term to think about what we might call a period piece, historical drama, period drama, 
Um, so period pieces refers to fictional film and television set in a past time period. In general, the period piece establishes historical context through mise-en-scene, such as costumes, styling, and set design. However, historians are skeptical of the ability of fictional film and television to portray history responsibly. At worst, these fantasies might imbue the spectator with a rosy nostalgia for the past's violent structures, such as empire, and they do so by eliding colonialism from their narratives. So here I advance a materialist analysis of historical television series to demonstrate how they in fact surface histories of imperial economic exploitation. This analysis intervenes against histories, studies, and constructions of national pasts and national media. So I present a global and transnational method of historiographic film analysis. And in this talk, ultimately, I argue that one, transnational modes of labor and cultural production undergird national ideologies and economies, and two, mainly that media communicates the materiality of these exchanges. So for this talk, I focus on the British television series Downton Abbey, which ran in Britain on ITV, um, in the US on PBS from 2010 to 2016, and there are also two films. Um, I will say, though, I focus on this here. Um, I argue that this you know, method is applicable to analyze period pieces, you know, especially from the last couple of decades broadly. So Downton Abbey um, set between 1910s and 1930s England um, was very an expensive show to produce, reportedly million pounds per episode, um, and they used this funding to invest in historical authenticity. The show's costume and production designers have received showcases in the press and in actual museum exhibitions for their meticulous recreation of English estates of the 1910s and 1920s. And in several interviews with the costume designers and production designers, they demonstrate sensitivity to how important these surfaces are to story and character. So, you know, as markers of class or gender position, um, things like that. And the costume designers, you know, in order to kind of recreate this world, drew on original sources from the time period, um, Victorian and Edwardian England, such as fashion plates, magazines, paintings, and other kinds of visual references. Um, and to produce the kind of, um, you know, set and costumes for the show, they restored vintage clothing, um, and they also sourced or crafted new items for the series. And the same is true for, you know, the furniture and interiors as well. So a little bit about Downton Abbey's kind of history and politics that it does articulate on the surface. Um, it adopts a contemporary liberal lens on 20th, early 20th century Britain. Its narrative displays a modest share of diversity and resistance, very much within the bounds of its historical framework. Um, its narrative is also anchored by real historical events and changes, such as the sinking of the Titanic, World War I, the 1918 pandemic, um, and things like the entries of new technologies into society, like telephones and you know, the common use of automobiles. So given its simultaneous investment in historical authenticity and its interest in the characterization of marginalized peoples, where can we locate empire in Downton Abbey? This is its historical lacuna, and it's not particular to television. Most of the actual houses um, in which these shows are filmed or where they're, you know, what they're based on, um, as well as museum exhibitions until recently, have evaded this question. So Downton Abbey, if you've seen it, the show is frequently concerned with the waning wealth of like the home family, the Crawley family, but it doesn't address how that wealth, which is so ostentatiously on display, was generated and maintained. It presumes that audiences understand the wealth as natural. So Britain's National Trust only recently in 2020 began sort of like, um, you know, to address this issue. And a survey that they published noted that these properties are furnished quite literally with funds gleaned from investment in the East India Company's enterprises through the colonial economic practice known as mercantilism. 
the textile trade became lucrative with South and Southeast Asian fabrics and textiles, textile designs growing in value. And within the colonies, British companies traded these goods for people who were forced into slavery and circulated to various ends of empire themselves. So a materialist lead reading can reveal that colonial history is actually central in Downton Abbey and similar shows. And you can see in the images here um, some of the textiles that I'm going to talk about. So one of Downton Abbey's most prominent textures is Kashmir, a goat hair textile that originates in Kashmir, the northernmost region in the Indian subcontinent. It appears frequently in the form of coats and shawls worn by women in the extended Crawley family. In each instance, it features variations on the delicate paisley embroidery known as cruel work that's also specific to Kashmir. Um, and if you go back to sort of Victorian and Edwardian literature and magazines, they often explicitly reference Indian objects and textiles as items of value. And even beyond sort of literary texts, you had images and descriptions of, you know, other objects of empire, such as Assam or Ceylon tea, Madras spices, and so on, kind of circulate um, in print culture. Um, this is here I have an example from the novel North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell, which has also been adapted into, you know, television series like multiple times um, where they sort of discuss coveting an Indian shawl. So these media representations aided in establishing the desirable status of empire's goods in metropolitan English lifestyles. Indeed, the marketing and consumption of empire goods in Britain heralded a new era in global consumer capitalism. As Joanna de Groot says, empire literally and figuratively marked the growth of modern consumer practices from the development of new working class diets to the commercialization of services and leisure. So what's the significance of these materials in the South Asian context where they originated? Kashmiri shawls um, and you know, other types of textiles that I discuss in this longer work remain widely worn and used in South Asia, particularly India and Pakistan, um, in reference to the ones that I talk about here. And while hand-woven and hand-embroidered clothing is somewhat limited now to those who have both cultural and actual capital, machine-made versions are worn by people of diverse classes and regional backgrounds. And how might, might South Asian viewers respond to seeing these textiles in Western film and media? Um, for this, I draw on Laura Marx, who writes on the power of objects communicated via film and other audiovisual media. She says, even commodities, though they're subject to the deracinating flow of the transnational economy and the censoring process of official history, retain the power to tell the stories of where they've been. So these costumes, as well as other textiles, such as the silk damask that lines the walls of Downton Abbey, which the production designer brought in from India, evoke India's most famous method of colonial resistance, which happened in a contemporaneous timeline as the series. The early 20th century's boycott and Swadeshi movements for Indian independence centered on disrupting Britain's exploitative economic practices that centered around the cultivation, manufacture, and sale of textiles. So meanwhile, Britain's own textile economy developed in relation to what Britons had learned about Indian weaving, printing, embroidery, and so on. As Chitraleka Zuchi notes, the con conversion and scaling of this expertise became key to Britain's story of modernity. As the textile industry grew in the metropole, it diminished local practices in the colonies. In protest, Indians were encouraged to boycott British manufactured clothing and to loom their own, raising the cultural value of handloom textiles, which persists to this day. So moving beyond a simple demonstration of the exotic or oriental, these objects help produce the image of empire and help to order life within the metropole. And these objects in the mise-en-scene are analogous to their historical position in English society, pervasive and invisible. So finally, I argue that these textiles, um, so, and some of the textiles in the show, the actual fabrics are existing products of empire. And at the same time, the qualities as realist in the context of the show's publicization of re its research expertise and consumer de demand for nostalgic British entertainment commodities likewise conditions the fabric status as heritage. 
Thus, Downton Abbey indexes a global history. And finally, this shift in the position of these media objects, this shifts the position of these media objects as vehicles of imperial nostalgia and as examples of Western media hegemony. Both are inextricable from labor and production from the global south. Thus, period pieces surface this history of exchange. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Nuri, and I will be talking about um, two texts, um, each called Vertigo Sea and Purple by a British artist called John Akumfra. Um, a little bit about Akumfra before I move into my main argument. Um, he was born in Ghana, but now based in London. He works with um, making film installations and um, experimental documentaries, he uses montage in a lot of his works, um, known for uh, films like the Handsworth songs, where he talks about, where he shows um, what it's like to live as a black British um, youth in 1980 South London and The Unfinished Conversation, which is a documentary about Stuart Hall. So some of the topics that he engages with repeatedly is the Black diasporic experience and the construction of collective history and memory. Um, and more recently, he's been more interested in the ecological as well. I'm going to move through the slides rather quickly. Um, so if you have any questions about the slides or want more information, please reach out to me after the Q&A, thanks. Um, in talking about his work today, I'd like to situate my discussion um, in between two different kind of discourses. One of it is about the more than human rhetoric, which um, is something that we see a lot with the rise of doom materialisms and a non-human turn, um, especially also in the environmental studies rhetoric, um, where we talk about the more than human beings, the environmental world and the natural world, things and non-human beings have as having agencies um, and bodies ha as having intercorporeal significance rather than individual subjectivities. So that's one. And I found something interesting, which is that more recently, artificial intelligence has been described as having a more than human kind of ontology as well, which I thought was fascinating. Um, the other side of it, the other discourse that I'd like to um, engage with a little bit is radical black thought um, and the way that it engages with more traditional Western ontology, um, especially as Akumfra talks a lot about blackness um, and at the same time engages with the question of ontology as well. Um, very interesting because he um, talks about blackness, but at the same time, when you think about the relationship of blackness to ontology, it has been known for, especially by Afro-pessimists like Franz Fanon um, on the slide here, um, is known for having a very radical kind of negativity um, signified by um, the notion of absence and non-being rather than having a positive value in the traditional Western ontological tradition. Um, so what we have here is a lack of congruence between the more than human discourse in the kind of environmental studies and then another on the side of critical black studies and critical race studies where we're talking about beings that are, if I may, less than human. So essentially my argument is that the two texts that I have um, singled out in Akumfra's work, Vertigo Sea and Purple, act as a response to um, a sort of nexus point between these two discourses as being able to respond to the environmental um, and the ecological problem as well as the ontological kind of problem and challenge of what it means to be human in the state of the planet today. And um, another argument that I'm making in the larger sense is that in order to talk about these two discourses together, cinema and media studies, and especially the talk of cinematic form has a significant role to play. 
So finally, Vertigo C. It premiered for the first time in 2015 in London. It's a three-channel installation, and the kind of unifying motif of the work is the ocean. Um, and Alcum represents it as a kind of history of the planet Earth, um, with the ocean as the perpetrator, witness, and the environment. Um, and a survivor of human and non-human histories. So we have images of the kind of turbulence in a very imagistic way, um, images of slavery, um, and more abstract images like time uh, in terms of clocks, images of climate change. Um, you can see the polar bears and the ice caps melting, images of hunting, the fishing and whaling industry. It's a very overwhelming vertiginous kind of work. There's also images of the migration crisis and a lot of underwater fauna and flora. It's a beautiful work. If you get a chance to see it, I recommend it highly. Um, I want to point out uh, one thing or two things. One is the motif of the clock, which um, kind of illustrates the multiplicity of different temporalities going on in this work, the planetary time, human time, colonial time, and the time of blackness and so forth. And another is, you can see the clocks on the right there. Um, another is the repeated motif of this man dressed in this red colonial outfit. Um, kind of immediately recognizable as uh, Olada Iguiano, a Nigerian freedman um, who's best known to us by his autobiography, The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olada Iguiano. Um, and he's always kind of standing in these images in the single panel. Um, so this panel would be one of the three panels, right? Something that I find really interesting is that he, as a historical figure, is given the language that he talks about his freedom and his humanity with in the very language and method that was taught to him by the power that denies him his humanity. So he exists in this perpetual space of the paradox. And someone like Fred Moten would say, this is precisely how there is a possibility for a very radical kind of freedom because he exists in the space that is outside of this logic in the paradox. So something that I'd like to observe is um, that the space of the paradox in the work of the Vertigo Sea is expressed in the images of water that don't really serve any narrative indexical function. We know that it's the ocean and we know that it's the motif of the uh, piece that pulls everything together, the montage form together, but at the same time, they seem to exist outside of the narrative structure. It kind of exists in this radical exterior place, much like the paradoxical space that um, Equiano talks from. Some more images. And then two years later, he um, presents Purple. It's a physical kind of expansion of his work also because it's six screen installation rather than three. And in this work, he engages a lot more with images of the Pacific Islands and a lot more focus on the ecological problem as well. But as you can see, the color blue, although that it's titled purple, um, and the motif of the water is very strong. The whole installation has a kind of very palpable wetness to it, I would say, with a lot of images that are submerged underwater and waters that are not only the ocean, but also just raindrops and streams, just presence of any kind of earthly water. And something that I'd like to point out in this work, um, these are some of the um, ideas that I would also identify with the space of the radical outside that I identified in Equiano's paradoxical space. But specifically in purple, because of his engagement with the Pacific Islanders, um, there is a notion in the Tongvan philosophy that has been um, theorized more recently by contemporary philosophers or thinkers, indigenous thinkers, called the Tava theory. Ta means time and Va means space. And a Tongan um, theorist called um, Augustina Mahina talks about a Tava theory of reality, which she kind of um, 
coagulates from indigenous knowledge that's accumulated over hundreds of years. Um, so her idea of this Tava reality is very cinematic in a sense, where we talk about the temporal and the spatial as occupying a singular reality that exists outside of the kind of linear, transparent um, flow of time that we associate with Western thought. So again, these are, Tava I think is one of the ideas that we can associate with, with the image of water and the space of the paradoxical um, existence that Equiano occupies. And again, the space that watery images occupy in these works. So overall, I think his over in the, uh, as exemplified by these two texts, we can talk about colonial histories and realities and different temporalities and the possibilities of freedom um, that the form illustrates to us, um, especially also vis-a-vis -vis the natural environment and the ecological problems. And because we're talking about the montage form, um, also a kind of media ecology where he talks about found footage and film footage. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much to the presenters for those wonderful papers. And I also had the pleasure of reading um, short versions of these papers along with uh, hearing the presentations uh, this morning, so my questions and my comments will draw upon those. Um, I'm sure the audience can sympathize with me here that these papers were quite different uh, from one another and we really traversed uh, film theory, environmental humanities, television, um, internet, media policy. So it was a bit of a task to be able to pull together all of these papers into something that might um, be a coherent, uh, generative, and productive discussion. So I'm actually going to begin with uh, Daniela and Ahmad, because um, both of your papers could be thematically connected around the broad issue of the internet and uh, the lives that people lead on it and what happens without access to the internet, especially in non-Western contexts. So um, I have a bunch of questions. You all don't have to answer them all. Uh, pick what um, resounds with you the most this morning. So Daniela, I'm going to begin with you. Um, your paper very rightly urges us to delink how we understand the internet from Western trajectories and case studies, and you offer us two examples from China, Badu and WeChat. So the larger paper I read also had a discussion of the uh, social messaging platform application WeChat, and how both are tied into the social fabric of society and people's physical networks in China. And Ahmad, uh, your paper read us to reflect upon the failure of broadband policies in rural Iraq and what it means to be disconnected in a connected world uh, where the right to internet access is seen as fundamental. And it reminded me of some of the very important uh, work on uh, digital infrastructures and digital passages, especially in the wake of the Syrian refugee crisis, which is also something that you briefly talked about. Um, so Daniela, for you, I would ask you to further reflect on a question that you asked, which is, what if the supposedly global digital age is a fundamentally different one on the other side of the planet? So while China has its own internet and it does help us rethink um, universal ideas as originating from the US, how might we place this alongside regional trajectories of other social media and messaging apps like Facebook? So what I'm trying to say, uh, like WhatsApp, I'm sorry. So what I'm trying to say here is that WhatsApp, for instance, is a um, platform and a messaging application that did originate in the US and is now part of Facebook. Um, but its trajectory has been quite unique in many Asian contexts. So for instance, India, 
where we actually now have terms like whatsapp university which is a term coined by the indian journalist ravish kumar uh, to casually and comically refer to how misinformation flows on the platform and how it's been worked and used by the current right wing bjp government to spread hate and fake news so technology while it might originate in the west of course cannot be a trojan horse from the west despite the presence of platforms um that originate in the us their local and regional trajectories always tell us uh different stories so daniela i would urge you to complicate notions of platform imperialism um and for questions how might we then understand digital cultures and its relationship to certain media geographies and media regions as opposed to um just looking at the US and China as to um you know completely opposite blocks and how might China's relationship to social messaging apps like WeChat be placed alongside what's happening in its neighboring countries like India and its trajectory with say WhatsApp And the second question I have for you is on the Chinese government's relationship to these platforms especially censorship um and to further push one of your points about how uh we should not jump to conclusions uh, reductive conclusions like how uh Chinese people might just be more social which is why their internet is um looser and more community based than Google and other US based um internet search engines but it is the shape of the internet that determines the way people use it so similarly how would uh, government regulation and censorship then shape both the material organization of baidu and wechat and the circulation of information on it um so those are my questions for you daniel and ahmed um i don't think you mentioned this here but in your paper you talk about uh, regulatory capture theory Uh, to discuss the neglect of rural areas in broadband connectivity so for those of us who might be unfamiliar with uh, media policy if you could elaborate more on regulatory capture as a research method i think that would be helpful and your your people also discusses that um the populations in rural iraq face severe and several challenges in their daily lives due to lack of internet access so has your research and i know it's still ongoing but has it led to some insights on re- or recommendations on how um, the telecom sector can address this lag in providing reliable broadband um to rural iraq so yeah so i will take your responses first before moving on to simran and anuri thank you Thanks uh thank you to report thanks so much uh, those are wonderful questions uh so I presume I presume that I'm going to take the the questions first because I got spotlighted so um <laughs> so that, I guess that that's what that means um so these are wonderful questions I want to start with your first question and just quickly say that um I completely agree with you uh that these different trajectories of WhatsApp um absolutely need to be WhatsApp and you know other similar apps absolutely need to be uh interrogated uh i think there's also a very interesting question also in the chinese context of you know who who gets access to um various western apps and for what purposes because those are very very different purposes uh, and are mediated through you know a vpn access as well so i completely agree with you that that work is very important um i would not want to exclude it but it's not the work of my project and that's simply for um the reason that i think that this is the research that is more typically happening um i think that this is the research that is um um perhaps i wouldn't say easier to do but perhaps a more common move among researchers um speaking for myself without wanting to sort of um blame or accuse anyone partially i think the reason for that is because we are simply more familiar with these apps um even within the indian context um which i am not very familiar with and i'm sure you know much more about um i presume that there are also very widely used applications that simply don't get the same kind of scholarly attention because they're just not on our radar so my work is really trying to push back uh against that type of um let's just say west centric radar if that makes sense um and so um that's why it's doing something a little bit different which is not to take away the importance of what you're describing um 
My answer is going to be disappointingly similar to your, uh, you know, question one point B and your question two. Uh, question one point B, according to my notes, being how might we add more blocks than just the U.S. and China? Um, I completely agree. Absolutely necessary. Uh, and I think you know the work on rural Iraq is. You know, I think that that would be a wonderful other block to add. Uh, something that I am not familiar with and, and don't think I am qualified to do. I hope in, in at some point to extend this focus. Um, at the moment, I am focusing on the U.S. Or, or, you know, the West as epitomized by the U.S., epitomized, but also in a material way represented by the U.S. Um, and China as the starting point. Uh, perhaps I will expand later. But partially the reason for focusing on just these two is because it, I think they really, really radically highlight the differences. Um, so, um, you know, I have other foci that I could uh, bring in, but I don't think that they would be so um, so radical, uh, so clear in their demonstration. And then finally, to just sum up and answer your question too, um, the relationship of the Chinese government to these platforms, a fascinating question and that would, um, you know, deserve its own book rather than just a book project that I'm working on. Uh, but I would want to say that, that that book, to some extent, exists. And it exists in many, many versions. Uh, because the relationship of the Chinese government to anything is typically a very privileged site of research when it comes to, you know, digital China. Um, an important one, but again, I think that there's a result here of downplaying the... Um, the vernacular, the quotidian uh, lives of Chinese netizens. Um, we're in a sort of too, too strong focus on the government. Um, and I just want to end with this final example that I, I, I thought was just so um, strange and, and, and kind of wonderful and also scary, uh, uh, you know, last fall during the kind of historical protests in China. Um, against the government and against the COVID policies, which ended up ultimately resulting in the, the reversal, the radical reversal of COVID policies. Um, there was a, a very strange moment where, um, where really, um, the fa although, you know, although the, the government and the censorship reach is quite fast, it's just that, you know, a calls for protesting circulated so rapidly before the censors were able to take them down, and these are algorithms, so they're not humans, um, that still, you know, millions of people would see them before, before they were removed. Um, so that there is a, a, a vast possibility for communication, even, even under such, you know, tight constraints. So I, I think it's a really, really complicated and, and quite fascinating um, relationship. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Uh, these are uh, two great questions. I'll start with the first one, explaining or uh, illustrating uh, what do we mean by um, the regulatory capture. It's it's basically a theory, uh, a theory, one of the uh, policy theories. So based on the um, the uh, rural, right, rural rural broadband policy um, themes that I have, I build these findings to the regulatory capture uh, theory. So what does it mean? Um, so the regulatory capture is just that um, any policies or regulations set up to benefit the private sector, not the public interest. Um, that is basically, uh, or in a, uh, in a simple uh, 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 meaning, uh, the uh, policies or regulations of any sector is captured by the uh, private sector. As we see here, uh, the Iraqi rural broadband policy basically is set up to benefit the uh, telecom telecommunication companies, not the rural Iraqis communities. For instance, like uh, freedom in mapping, um, freedom uh, and restricted time frame to finish the broadband projects, um, freedom in allocating money. Uh, all of these policies basically is captured by the uh, telecommunication companies uh, by the private sector is set up to benefit these these uh, this private sector not specifically the um, uh, the uh, uh, the rural Iraqis um, uh, uh, demands uh, to improve the rural broadband um, uh, policy uh, ac uh, uh, access uh, there in, uh, in their communities uh, for uh, the second question is um, the 
Uh, the other, I'm sorry, was it probably is not really here. Um, so the other, um, uh, the other question, the second question is basically, um, again, this work is still in progress, but I can see that uh, based on the initial results uh, that I have, um, I can recommend um, from the Ministry of Communication of Iraq to uh, have more restrict regulations on the private sector, the telecommunication sector, uh, in terms of uh, monitoring the um, uh, the uh, mapped area, mapping the area uh, that I will be served with broadband connection. Um, also, the time frame to build and finish uh, the broadband um, uh, infrastructure in rural areas, and um, uh, especially also uh, the amount of money that is dedicated to uh, build more infrastructure in the rural broadband area. Um, so, um, and one more uh, notes that I wanted to mention about the uh, Iraqi rural broadband uh, policies, that a lot of these policies has been changed um, since 2003 after the occupation of the uh, US there in Iraq. So these policies basically is kind of like turns towards turns to be more a uh, new liberal uh, than it's uh, centralized or uh, controlled by the um, by the state itself. So uh, in another way, uh, the rural broadband policy uh, it gives uh, more freedom uh, to uh, the, the private sector uh, than before. And uh, we see that we saw we saw that a new liberal shift uh, basically um, um, uh, in the example of uh, the uh, rural broadband uh, issues uh, that I explained through these three main uh, themes. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll move on to um, Simran and Anuri. Both of your papers um, look at how the empire is remembered and made legible in contemporary media. So while Downton Abbey is a popular television show whose modes of spectatorial address are of course vastly different from the work of uh, John Akumfra. Both of you evoke the figure of the post-colonial spectator and how they might redeem certain narratives through these representations. So I would begin by asking you both to reflect more on this spectatorial address, um, given that both your projects actually um, look at Britain and race and empire are of course understood very differently in Britain than for instance in the US or even Australia and uh, there are large diasporic and immigrant audiences from India and Africa who consume this media uh, that you both discussed um, and Simran in your paper though it wasn't in your presentation today you talked a little bit about the streaming spectator and how the kind of pixelation afforded by this mode of viewing um, allows us as audiences to come close. You know, um, you evoked this haptic um, sort of touch, comes close to, you know, textiles from Kashmir or Lucknow. Um, so could you tell us more about how we might construct the audience and whether you primarily see them as digital or a film audience because there were a couple of films made on Downton Abbey um, or a television audience. And I think your uh, larger project also looks at Bridgerton. So feel free to include that in your response because I think that's how you came up with the streaming spectator more with Bridgerton because, so yeah, those are my uh, comments and questions for you. And Yuri, could you tell us more about where the installations were shown and where they traveled to? Uh, who were the intended audiences? And how might interpretations of race, environment, and the filmmaker's own positionality as an African immigrant filmmaker in Britain be read differently across different exhibition contexts? And uh, what has been some of the critical response to this work? Or how might we chart um, if you were to do a discourse analysis um, of this experimental video installation, where might we begin and um, how might we, you know, where, where would we go from there? Um, I was also very interested to know about the role of sound in these video installations and if you could elaborate a little bit more on sound as uh, materiality in these, in these installations. Thank you. ahead first. Uh, thank you so much for your response and for your questions. 
Um, yeah, so I'll start by kind of thinking about spectatorship, um, post-colonial spectatorship and streaming. Um, yeah, even though Downton Abbey was not initially a streaming television show, it is a digital television, which means, you know, it's shot on, at least as I use it, it means it's shot on digital cameras um, as opposed to celluloid film. Um, and then it, you know, of course, is circulated and widely watched digi digitally. Um, that's how someone like me was able to watch it when I was in a living in India. Um, and I'm sure, you know, many of you, if you've seen that show or kind of equivalent shows, use platforms like Netflix or Amazon or, you know, so on and so forth. So I think that we can bring that kind of lens to think about Downton Abbey. Um, but also kind of the broader body of media that I'm thinking about. And so here I draw on, I mentioned this briefly in the presentation, but Laura Marx, who's a film scholar, her kind of theory of haptic visuality. And for that, she's looking at what she calls intercultural media, um, film and television, um, film and video rather, that's kind of you know, produced between cultures or has this like transnational aspect to it or speaks, you know, produced in one national context, but like has the kind of um, history or like mark of another culture on it. And she's talking about, you know, again, celluloid film and videotape um, that employs cinematic devices such as the extreme close up, um, kind of modes of slow, slow cinematography, um, kind of speaking a bit maybe to kind of work that Anuri is looking at. Um, and that, of course, is not at all what Downton Abbey is. Downton Abbey is like a crisp, clear digital image um, it, you know that uses kind of like wide shots and you know presents its mise-en-scene in a very different manner but I argue that because <coughs> it's digital television you know there's this idea that you know television is kind of linked to intimacy and domesticity because of how and where you consume it right um, and I think that's even more true for kind of streaming television you watch it maybe on your laptop, on your phone, um, definitely like in the home or in kind of an intimate space. Um, and the clarity of the images actually is what is able to produce, for example, my engagement with this to, you know, not only see the textiles, but identify like, yes, this is like a Lucknowi embroidery or Parsi embroidery or Kashmiri or whatever it is. Um, and especially because, again, it's television, so it's serialized you know, it's 60 episodes or something like that, you have a sustained engagement that allows you to bring this kind of close attention to it. Um, yeah, I don't know if, I, I think I'm still grappling with whether it's, I don't know if I'd say like spectatorship can redeem it, but it can certainly bring, you know, a different lens to it and, and a pleasure of spectatorship as well. Um, and then for the second sort of part of your question about Bridgerton, that's part of a longer project and that is actually kind of the sort of inverse of Downton Abbey and these other shows in the sense that it's not trying to be historical and realist, right? It is like an overt fantasy um, that changes the nature of historical fact to kind of incorporate racial difference, um, sexual difference in this kind of contemporary progressive lens. Um, but I'm interested in the kind of costumes and mise-en-scene production there because they too, like, use, you know, again, they're not kind of indebt indebted to historical accuracy and so they sort of employ um, contemporary sort of influences and in how they might imagine what, like, a, you know, African origin or Indian origin ar aristocrat might wear in, like, Regency era Britain. Um, but for that to, I sort of look at an analog to kind of contemporary textile production and trade. Um, and yeah, for that I'm kind of uh, drawing on another film scholar, um, David James, who, you know, talks about how fil every film is an allegory of its own production. And so you kind of, uh, you know, the kind of, um, what's the right word, like polyester and nylon and like textiles that you get. See, see it get used in Bridgerton, um, you know, I make an argue, argument about the analogy to kind of its, its lens on history. Uh, thank you. Thank you.
Um, thank you for those questions. It's a lot, and I'm really glad, <laughs> uh, especially for some of them because it's something that I'd like to talk about but didn't. Yeah. Um, so first to touch on the spectatorial experience, I would say the works are primarily intended for um, actually the museum going crowd. Mm -hmm. He primarily works in the museum setting, although he does work with the film medium. A lot of his films are installations. Um, like I couldn't get a copy of Purple, for instance, because the artist um, insists that it be watched in the setting that it was meant to, especially because it's multiple mm -hmm. um, screens. Um, so I would say that about the spectatorial experience. It's not meant for a popular audience in the same way that something like Downton Abbey mm -hmm. um, is. Um, but at the same time, I would say that he very much puts a lot of that into the material environment of the installation um, when I went to watch, and just partially answers how the exhibit travels in different parts mm -hmm. of the world. Um, when Purple premiered in Boston ICA in 2017, it was actually commissioned by different museums in metropolitan cities around the world. One of them was London, the other in Madrid, a city in Russia that I don't remember right now, um, one in Argentina. Um, so it traveled here, it premiered in Boston in the same year, and it was um, presented at their shipyard, um, which is called the Watershed. It's like a satellite location to the ICA. You have to take a boat ride for like three minutes to get to this location. And it used to be this abandoned, abandoned shipyard that the city and the museum invested money into and then turned into like a cultural hub. And there's an installation about the history of the shipyard and the, all the labor histories. Um, and you had to go through that in order to see purple while laying down on the couches and cushions too, right? So um, I would say that because it's a traveling exhibit and because it's not, it doesn't share the same kind of digital um, and virtual um, availability of some of the other popular media um, texts, paradoxically, it is able to create a whole different kind of experience. Um, and as far as Vertigo C, it premiered in London, in the Barbican, and then it also <coughs> traveled um, around the world. Um, I don't remember where it was shown in the US, but it was. Um, and then at some point in Toronto, which is where I went to see, see it. Um, yeah, so I don't know when it's going to be exhibit again, but if it is, please go check it out. Um, sound, um, a lot of it is diegetic sound. So some of the clips were um, archival footage that um, Akumbra found in nature documentaries and newsreels. Others he filmed specifically to make these works. So it's a, the soundtrack is a mix of diegetic sounds, but also there's narration that he wrote um, and plays alongside these images. And um, I'm talking about Vertigo C, the narration. It's a mix of different quotes from uh, popular, well-known literary texts about the ocean. So um, for instance, there's quotes about the sublime, um, quotes from the movie Dick, um, about the whaling industry. Um, and at some point there are quotes about um, Equiano's first um, moment, the originary kind of moment of you know being found in his new life. Um, so it's a mix of quotes um, and mix of diegetic sounds that very similarly to the image has this whole tapestry of chaotic and multivalent, um, overwhelming um, scope of different uh, realities and materialities. Um, race. So he's African <laughs> British. Um, and I'm guessing that one of the questions why it's an important to ask is because, well, here, we, when we talk about blackness, we're primarily talking about blackness as an uh, African American mm -hmm. construct. Um, it's interesting to think about that because at least in um, Vertigo C, 
I haven't really noticed it before I started thinking about your question more seriously, but Akumfra is very much interested not really in the reality of the present, in the present of being a black man living in the UK, but rather the very kind of originary moment of blackness being born from Africa, from the mil Middle Passage, from, from slavery. Um, and as you could probably gather, I'm a lot more interested in the kind of theoretical construct of what blackness means vis-a-vis -vis the ways that traditional Western philosophical traditions talk about being as such and human life as such. Um, so I would say that Akumfra shares very much of that thread. So for instance, one of the quotes that I wanted to mention, and maybe some of you caught it in the slides, is that his philosophy is described as an oceanic, oceanic ontology, um, where he's talking about how the ocean houses, the ocean is kind of the oikos, the home to all these different historical and philosophical lineages um, of being human, of planetary history, of um, realities of being plants, being animal, um, and even technological objects also. Um, so he's talked, th that's why the ocean plays a very important role in kind of folding together as a witness to these different kinds of histories. So I would say because, I would say that his role as a black artist rather than say black British artists is a lot more central to his work, at least in Vertigo C. In his mm -hmm. other works, the Britishness is a lot more foregrounded, <laughs> especially when he talks about Stuart Hall and yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think, th thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll go until 11.15 uh, because lunch only starts at 11.30, if that's fine with everybody. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll take a couple of questions from Zoom and then we can hand it over to the, to the audience. Okay. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. One from Fan Yang uh, from UMBC, which is for uh, Enuri. Uh, I just saw pur Purple at Hishon yesterday and I was really glad to hear the, the last talk. Uh, I wonder if the speaker can say more about the multiple screens as part of, uh, of, of the artist's uh, installations in relation to the fragment and times and histories. Thanks. Uh, and then a question for Simran. Uh, which historical elements would you summar summarize as being uh, essential to be included in programs based on historical fiction? Like apart from textiles, what else can, can these be? What can, can these elements be uh, that mark the, histo the historiography uh, of such programs? Thank you. Um, okay, great that you could take a look at purple. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, yeah, so it's six screens. And I don't know if you saw, the pictures are what I took in Boston. They're set up so that you can never look at the six screens at once. So I was just kind of very frantically turning left and right to take pictures of the both over multiple showing, multiple um, uh, uh, viewings of it. So Akumfra actually talks about it in an interview where his intention, where he talks about his intention as um, creating the sense of um, extreme Extremely, being extremely overwhelmed, not being able to situate oneself in vis-a-vis vis -vis this um, very vast um, scope of different kinds of challenges that we're facing. The way that I would add to that um, in thinking about the overwhelming nature of it is also the kind of ecological um, and racially um, born anxieties that we feel today. I guess the term would be ecological anxiety, right? Not knowing where we are and not knowing what exactly we have to do in the stream of kind of um, never ending updates to the oncoming ecological catastrophes and the end of the world. Um, but at the same time, I would say the not being able to locate oneself and the images of the water as the kind of paradoxical exterior space also leaves a lot of room for us to think about what possibilities there can be. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, in regards to the kind of other sort of objects of mise-en-scene that speak to you know real historical pasts, 
So textiles really, uh, you know, ex we can think about that expansively to include sort of design and patterns. So even in kind of the words, the names of things you see, origins, you know, Paisley, yes, but like chintz, which is kind of the floral pattern that you'd see on couches, for example, um, comes from an Indian word, chint, um, and, you know, the invention of kind of a pattern and the way that it was sort of block printed and reproduced. Um, or the taffeta, the fabric, comes from a Persian word, tafte, you know, damask from Damascus, so on and so forth. And you see that, like, on the wallpapers, on the furniture, um, and then, of course, like, with the clothes, um, which is what I kind of focused on here. Um, and then for sort of other, you know, it, it's not necessarily just a focus on South Asia, but you see sort of, like, Chinese, Southeast Asian, um, you know, East African items and textiles as well. So this you know, yeah, extends to kind of re really everything that fills sort of the home um, is, I think, evidence of kind of, you know, m colonial trade and colonial exploitation, again, not just in South Asia, but to kind of every end of the British Empire. Um, I hope, yeah, that answers the question. Thank you so much for um, the four fascinating papers. I have um, actually two questions for Anne-Marie. Um, so I think the first, I, I was just so fascinated by the concept of um, Aquari Aquarius um, Earth, because I think that um, definitely proposed a orientation for a kind of oceanic-centric understanding of how being can be, um, can be practiced and actually can be imagined as well. So. I just I think you kind of touch on that in your response to professors' um, 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 questions, but I was just thinking about um, I, I was just wondering, can you talk about more about the materi material and historic historical specificities of the ocean, um, especially in relation to um, to the concept of um, you know. If we think about being as you know, being on the ground, standing on the ground, then how does the categories of non-being or more than human being actually uh, perform in this kind of perpetual movement, mobility, and transportation that has a very interesting, uh, very important historical connections with, um, say, uh, migration, uh, refugee migration. Uh, black Atlantic movement, for example. So I think that just has a very interesting connection and I'm thinking about if you can talk about more about that. And my second question is actually relate to something you just mentioned that how to actually do you have some insight um, about how to do research on installation arts that uh, it's just hard to have access to because it's sometimes energy, environmental, and, you know, just financially burdened um, to do some kind of, um, you know, visiting t to some extent, but yeah. Wow, those are such great questions. Um, the first one, I think <laughs> that my answer just might be, that's my dissertation. <laughs> um, but to kind of um, leave a quick comment, um, I think it's, tricky um, to think about the ocean or just the ground of water um, as something that stands beside or beyond like the ground of being as we have talked about it in the more traditional sense because with the kind of oceanic churn and the blue humanities in the recent decades um, I think the impetus is also to think about it in positive kind of almost Deleuzean terms where we're not saying the ocean is something other to what already exists but also a new ground for things to be in a different way rather than um, rather than a ground for non-being, right? So I think it's very tricky to kind of um, figure out one's footing um, to talk about a very radical kind of exteriority or absence or what word you might have without um, without the negate without negating the necessity to talk about the material presence of the people or the beings that they correspond to. Um, having said that. I think that's the reason why I am um, 
drawn to talking about images of water rather than waters, like actual <laughs> oceans and waters themselves. Um, that's, I think, a whole other kind of area of study with different methodologies. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting things being done in that field. Um, what I'm interested is in is um, what I'm calling the aqueous image. I'm more interested in thinking about what the cinematic image of water um, portrays that are constructing and um, shaping how we think about different kinds of being. And I think that's kind of my passage to find that difficult footing that I talked about earlier. Um, the other question about insulations, I mean, that's a really great question. I don't really have an answer. But at the same time, you know, when I saw, um, when, uh, Vertigo C was playing in North America. I think this was in Toronto. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I really wanted to go, but I couldn't go because it was COVID. You know, I couldn't really fly. I don't think there were restrictions, but I didn't want to risk getting sick. Um, I did have a friend living in Toronto, and I asked him to go see it, asked him to go take pictures, um, to write diligent notes. And it helped that I had already seen it, just not well enough to do research and write about it. Um, and I didn't end up publishing this anywhere, but the plan was, um, and I think it would have been really great if I did, um, to kind of do a case study of what it means to do research during COVID. And I think the same kind of restrictions apply when you talk about installations or media pieces that you have to be present for actually, right? Like, what if you can't go for whatever reason? So I think there's interesting creative, like, kind of way around um, navigating that. And if you do that, there's um, interesting kind of methodologies that you're creating while you do that. Like, imagine a paper where you simply converse with your friend about their experience and what you remember. I think that's really interesting, even though it might be a little different from what you wanted to do. This was actually an advice that my my advisor gave me, which I thought was great. So I'm just. Do you have some more questions? Yeah, just Please, yes. yeah, I have a question. Uh, thanks for getting us off to such a fabulous start. Uh, thank you for all to, all to all of you for such great papers. My question is for Anuri, and it actually follows up on the first question. Um, I uh, I get the sort of um, uh, adoption as well as I think sideways critique that you made of the Blue Humanities project. But I'd also like to talk about uh, an older project which is the uh, Oceans Connect project which is um, largely one of historians. Can you see me? Yeah. Um, as a way to really conceptualize what um, empires and trade routes and um, and uh, pilgrimages and other forms of movement historically um, are worth kind of recalling uh, to critique the, uh, the emergence of the modern nation state. So it, it was and is a project with a very kind of uh, distinct and specific political agenda. And from what I could tell of the installation that you analyze, it seemed to me that that would be a really, really fecund connection to make, especially around race, because what the Oceans Connect historians are doing are really kind of drawing um, a deep historical connection between, say, the Middle Passage, right, and, um, and the development of certain kinds of, um, you know, racial capitalist uh, formations, um, even in the 21st century. So uh, just a suggestion more than a question, but thanks for a fantastically um, you know, generative paper, and I'd love to keep talking with you. Um, yeah, I also wanted to thank the four presenters for the excellent papers, and I'm and it's so interesting for me how certain terms circulate and how you use them differently, but also, so I'm thinking, for instance, of the coupling of interface and surface or surfacing, but also freedoms or, you know, freedom used in very different contexts. And my question was actually, if you um, 
could talk a little bit more about the context of the the use free like freedom of money, freedom of mapping, right? And um, and I don't know if this is too much of a stretch, but also if you had any thoughts on the relation between freedom, like as a you know kind of top down uh, political term, but then also the experience, the lived experience of waiting, so freedom and waiting. All right, thanks so much. Uh, so uh, these three main themes that I found uh, um, for the Iraqi rural broadband policies uh, in terms of the freedoms, um, it's kind of like a, the freedom specifically, the word freedom reflects the uh, unregulated um, or the, um, the space that has been given uh, by the Ministry of Communication of Iraq to the private sector. Uh, or if we wanna, if we wanna put it simply, it's the uh, a new liberal turn that is uh, basically has been um, uh, used by the Ministry of Communication of Iraq or the telecommunication sector in general um, uh, in terms of giving um, uh, the space uh, uh, without regulations, uh, without strict regulations to um, uh, to map the areas, the rural areas that will be served by the rural broadband uh, connection or to withdraw the money, the freedom, uh, that's that's what I uh, basically meant. Uh, and it's basically uh, captured uh, by the interest of that private, uh, uh, this freedom or these two main freedoms, freedom in mapping and freedom in, um, uh, in uh, allocating the money, it's basically captured by uh, the private uh, sector, the telecommunication companies. So it's a little bit different than, you know, the meaning of the freedom, such as uh, like that, what we all know. Um, so hope this uh, clarified and answered your question. Questions? Thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, Ahmed and also for Simran. I'll start with uh, yours. I was wondering between this question of like availability and uh, unavailability of internet, how does the um, how does the like social life or the life worlds of uh, rural Iraqis change? And apart from like this uh, easy equation of like if internet is available or not, like when when we when you are making a certain kind of argument about. Uh, this like decade has passed and yet there is like no steady broadband i was wondering if there is uh like um, a site to do some kind of like i don't know social life readings of how does that like that problematic of not having the internet gets bypassed or if it doesn't get bypassed what does it mean for uh, this problem to um, stay over or continue to have its uh, if its impacts through this like whole decade and beyond and for uh, Simran, I had like um, two questions. Uh, the first one was the the question over the like the status of materiality within your work, because apart from this like easy aesthetics reading, like I see this kind of cloth on screen, I this these patterns on screen. I wonder like what can we say if we can say anything about the circulations of commodities or of textiles in colonial and post-colonial periods. And the second kind of interrelated question is um, like, what happens to commodities as they circulated within colonial empire and as they resurface within colonial times? Like, is there at the level of commodity itself, is there a distinction that needs to be made? Or would you say like both of them are functioning just as abstract commodities that were initially circulating because of the empire circuits and now are circulating because of the post-colonial circuits. All right, thank you so much. Uh, this is a really great question and it goes back to the history of providing the um, essential services to rural, to rural communities in Iraq. And this kind of like old new problem um, as we see uh, over the history, uh, rural Iraqi communities um, suffer from lacking essen essential services such as electricity and telephone, landline phone services. And then after 2003, um, uh, a, l a lot of telecommunication companies started to build more infrastructure in the main cities such as Baghdad, Basra, Mosul and others. 
uh, just to benefit and get more from uh, the investments, get more returns from the investments. Though at the same time, um, rural areas uh, that, uh, that, uh, that basically the Ministry of Communication labels uh, these rural areas are uh, the uh, population of 3,000 or less and located outside of the main cities still not provided with um, uh, uh, infrastructure to build uh, the uh, broadband access. And so um, Iraqi uh, politicians started to realize this problem uh, back in 2009 and they um, had this concern of like those rural Iraqis um, uh, need to provide with rural bro broadband uh, uh, access, uh, and so they set up that national internet project to, um, you know, to allocate money and to map the uh, rural areas um, with um, uh, that will be provided with bro uh, rural uh, with a broadband uh, service. But between uh, 2010 until 2000 until actually today's date, uh, not much has done through uh, that implemented rural broadband policy and. Uh, mainly as as we saw because of uh, the main three issues as at least that I saw uh, through this uh, rural broadband um, uh, policy that is set up by the Ministry of Communication of Iraq. So this is kind of like um, a brief history of, you know, uh, what, you know, what rural Iraqis needs uh, in terms of, you know, accessing the, the uh, uh, broadband connection and what has to be done. And again, some rural communities, uh, in fact, provided with uh, 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 essential infrastructure uh, to uh, supply them with uh, broadband uh, access, but it's still they're complaining about uh, the uh, uh, the internet is still intermittent and uh, there is a slow speed of the internet. So uh, there is a lot has to be improved in terms of um, you know, restricting and put more strict regulations on the private sector in order to improve the uh, uh, broadband access, specifically in rural areas in Iraq. Um, thank you for your questions. Yeah, so I think, um, let, let me know if I'm addressing them correctly, but in terms of kind of you know, the circulation of commodities. Um, one, you asked about, like, sort of, um, you know, what is it beyond the fact that they, like, exist, you know, on screen in the text? And I think, um, so one is sort of, like, this idea that, you know, Britain's sort of trade and use of textiles and other goods of empire, like, help determine its modernity um, and its sort of um, so social culture, right? Um, at the time, and, and it did in South Asia too, and you know, wherever else these kinds of objects were generated from. And so for a, a show, you know, where like, you know, on the kind of, the, the text focus on sort of, let's say class relations and gender relations, you know, those are very much like the sort of encoded like in the use of objects as well, like the gifting of a particular type of shawl or like, you know, the relegation of like certain kinds of objects and textiles to use by women as opposed to men, um, you know, if in 19th century literature it would have been sort of openly articulated, but when it gets transferred to the televisual mode or filmic mode, then it isn't sort of spoken, but it exists in the kind of, in the mise-en-scene and in the visual, um, the sort of use of the commodity. And yeah, I think, you know, Abadira and others like in the social life of things talk about how the use of the commodity sort of gives like life and meaning to the commodity. Um, and I think that is something that's communicated sort of in, in the shows and in the films without again explicitly articulating it. So I think it, you know, I if you sort of like uh, enter into this recognition, it does sort of like encode and contain this history of not just the textile trade, but like, you know, really broadly speaks to the independence movement given the time period of um, of the show and, you know, the textiles. And then um, you also, I think, asked a question about, you know, the textiles circulating during the colonial period and then how these actual, like, real textiles circulate now. Um, I think, yeah, that's a great question. It kind of leads into, like, sort of a the larger project that I'm thinking about, um, you know, about sort of 
the production of digital television um, in relationship to the kind of sort of trade of objects and sort of like exploitative, um, you know, and extractive kind of um, labor that's performed in order for these these cultural products to exist, which is sort of again effaced in the in the narrative, but actually like surfaces, I argue, in the sort of subtext or text of the film and the show. I hope that answers it a bit. Thank you. All right, so we can continue these conversations. Uh, at lunch, which is at 11.30. And then our next panel is at 12.30 uh, this afternoon.